Our next speaker is someone we're familiar with and someone we're just so glad to have back with us again. Uh, last year, John Fund addressed this, uh, this luncheon and uh, was just, you know, was just awesome. Uh, he's, a, he's a writer, he's a speaker, but what I think is most important about John Fund is he's a thinker. John Fund, you know, understands issues and he can write them so we can understand them and he can come up, you know, with ideas and solutions that we can act on. And uh, we're really glad to have John Fund with us again today. John, come on up. Well, it's been a tough week. Stan Evans, who is one of Washington's leading conservatives many years ago, said, the saddest thing about Washington is watching your friends come to Washington determined to drain the swamp. And after a few years, they decide that it makes a great hot tub instead. I think that somehow is relevant this week. You know... I have the easy job, uh, whether it's for National Review, where I'm now a national political columnist, or the Wall Street Journal, where I remain a contributor, or Fox News Channel. I have the easy job. I get to chronicle and report on what you do, what Dick Armey started with Freedom Works, what Matt Kibbe is doing with his new book and with the great rally he's going to have in Texas and everything else that Freedom Works does. You do all the work. All of you are the activists. You put the signs up. You talk to your neighbors. You raise the money to keep your fledgling organizations going. So I have the easy job. I get to report on your successes and a few failures. So I am humbled and honored to be here in your presence. And I have two messages for you. One is to discuss disappointment, and the other is to discuss fraud. First, the disappointment. Let's not pull any punches. Yes, in the long run, there are some constitutional doctrines laid down in the Obamacare decision that may be of use to us. The Supreme Court finally said there is some outer limit by which the Commerce Clause cannot be used to regulate our economy. There is some outer limit by which the Necessary and Proper Clause can't be allowed to read any overweening government intervention or activity. But in the short term, this has been a grievous defeat. And the silver lining, of course, is I think it will energize you and the base of the conservative movement and millions of independents, because we all know what kind of job we have to do this November. But let's be clear what the stakes were. How did this happen? Well, you can go back to 2005, when George W. Bush had a Supreme Court vacancy that he had to fill. And originally, it was going to be Sandra Day O'Connor's seat. And then after the death of Chief Justice William Rehnquist, it became the Chief Justice's position. He had many candidates. Uh, I know John Roberts. I like John Roberts. but. John Roberts, was the joke in Washington always was, he was the lawyer who acted most like a politician who wasn't yet one. And I think we saw the politician at work trying to have something for everyone uh, this Thursday. But you know, just as Solomon in the Bible couldn't split the baby in half without killing it, so too you cannot split our constitutional freedoms in half and only give us half of them or half measure. So President Bush decided that he needed a chief justice who, above all else, would support him on the war on terror and support him on decisions affecting Guantanamo and detainees and everything else. And those are all legitimate national security concerns. But everything else was secondary. There were several other justices who I think were of sterner stuff and stiffer spine and less sometimes sunshine patriots than the person he eventually picked. But that's history. That was his decision. John Roberts has been a good Chief Justice. In fact, he's been a very good Chief Justice up until the very last few days of May. Because let me tell you the sad truth. 
and this was reported in today's Wall Street Journal. There is a telling note in the dissent in the Obamacare case that was signed by the four justices, Alito and Scalia and Thomas and Kennedy, who, by the way, was the most vociferous opponent of Obamacare, believe it or not. The telling note in the Scalia dissent is that nine times, nine times in that dissent, Scalia and the other justices refer to the concurring opinion of Justice Ginsburg on the left wing of the court as the dissent. This is not a typo. In a Supreme Court decision which is carefully, carefully proofread, you do not say nine times the dissent when it's the concurrence unless you have a message to send. What kind of message are you sending? What kind of message are you sending when you constantly refer, we have found, or we the court, in the dissent? What kind of message are you sending? The message you are sending is, this wasn't the dissent. This was the majority opinion. It was the majority opinion until the first week of June. This is what the Wall Street Journal says today, and I can confirm this. We may never learn if the Chief Justice truly changed his mind, but if it is true, this is far more damaging to the court's institutional integrity that the Chief Justice is known to revere than any ruling against Obamacare. The political class and the legal left conducted an extraordinary campaign of intimidation and vilification to define any decision against Obamacare as partisan illegitimate that would tarnish the reputation of the court as they have tried to tarnish the reputation of the court after Bush v. Gore in 2000 and the Citizens United case in 2010. If the Chief Justice capitulated to this pressure, it shows the court can be intimidated and swayed from its constitutional duties. If this was a play to compete with the late Chief Justice John Marshall's legacy, the result is closer to Supreme Court Justice William Brennan's legacy. The problem is that all of this rewrote the law of Obamacare. This and even the five votes limiting Congress under the Commerce Clause pale against the Chief Justice's infinitely elastic and dangerous interpretation of the taxing power. Nancy Pelosi famously said we need to pass Obamacare to find out what's in it. It turns out we also needed John Roberts to write Obamacare's appendix and to decide that even though Congress lied to us and deceived us by saying this wasn't a tax, and President Obama deceived us by saying it wasn't a tax, and President Obama's lawyers claimed it was both a tax and a fee, depending on which side of the constitutional argument was made, even though no one ever said this was a tax who voted for it. In fact, the one time, the one amendment that said Obamacare's individual mandate should be a tax was defeated in Congress because taxes are unpopular you would have been taking notice. So no one said it was a tax, except at the last minute, the Chief Justice of the United States. That's how disappointing this is. In fact, the internal inconsistency of his opinion, which was hastily written, is this. There's something called the Anti-Injunction Act. In fact, the first day of all the oral arguments in Obamacare was about the Anti-Injunction Act. What does the Anti-Injunction Act say? It says, if something is a tax, you can't sue to overturn it until the tax has actually taken effect, until there's actual victims, people hurt by the tax. So Obamacare's taxes don't kick in until 2014. Courts could say, if this is a tax, we can't sue. We can't have a resolution of this case until 2014. Well, the court ignored the anti-injunction arguments. It swept those away. But then Justice Roberts says it is a tax. Well, if it's a tax, it's covered by the anti-injunction amendment, which means he shouldn't have ruled on it. He should have waited two years. That's how awful and sloppily written this decision was. And you know why? All things done at the end of the day when your homework is almost due and when you've changed the title of your thesis paper from black to white, all of that is always sloppy. So too is this decision. Now, by the way, this is not the end of the constitutional challenges to Obamacare. There will be a challenge on the employer mandate part and the new IRS regulations redefining government subsidies, but that will have to wait a couple of years. So don't think that this is the final, final, final bite at the apple. In two or three years, we may yet be again before the Supreme Court. But before then, we have to stop Obamacare before it's actually enacted. 
before the before the entitlement before the insidious sickness of dependency and entitlement once again infects the character of some of our citizens and makes them wards of the state when it comes to health care. Now, moving to the other subject. Obviously, this makes the stakes in this election even bigger than ever. Well, isn't it interesting? 80% of the American people support photo ID at the polls. 80% of the American people support measures to improve the integrity of the ballot. Majorities of African Americans, majorities of Hispanics, majorities of Democrats, majorities of liberals, majorities... In fact, a pollster told me support for voter integrity is so great, it even exceeds support for motherhood and apple pie. Because some people are estranged from their mother, and some people just don't like apple pie. (laughs) But the Obama administration, led by presumed Attorney General Eric Holder... The Obama administration does nothing but prevent efforts at voter fraud. They sue every state that has voter fraud. They sued the state of Florida because it wanted to remove dead people and non-citizens from the rolls. Well, just this week, on Wednesday night, a Clinton-appointed judge, federal judge in Florida, threw out the government's request to stay Florida's voters search. The central argument of the government is you cannot change election, Florida election law 90 days before an election without the federal government's permission, namely Eric Holder's permission. The federal judge appointed by Bill Clinton pointed out, well, that may be true, but it's not changing election law to remove non-citizens and illegal aliens and dead people from the voting rolls. That's not a change. That's improving the election law. You know how hard the labor unions and the left fought in this state to get rid of your election reform changes. They basically ran them out of town. You had to drop them without to avoid the referendum that probably would have meant their defeat, although I'm not certain of that. Now, why is this? Why are they doing this? I have two possible explanations. One is what a former Democratic congressman told me. He said, when I interviewed him several years ago, he said, you know, your friends, these conservatives, they don't understand what this whole election shenanigan thing is about. And I said, well, please enlighten me. And he said, when your friends lose an election, they go back to something I've heard is called the private sector. When my friends lose an election, they don't eat. He said, in order, because they depend on government jobs, patronage, labor union dues, whatever it is, they are tied in. Their life is dependent on the government, largesse that they get. He said, my friends will sometimes do things their mother would not be proud of because you've got to eat. And people will do an awful lot of things they're not proud of and their mother wouldn't like in order to eat. The second explanation I've heard is, maybe they know something about what happens behind the polling booth curtain that we don't know about. Maybe they have more knowledge about what happens in Cleveland and Akron and Columbus and Cincinnati and Dayton that we don't know about. Just maybe they realize why they can't have voter integrity at the polls, because it will mean a less loosey-goosey system that they can manipulate and take to court. We just had an article appear in the Associated Press yesterday Obama is deploying 10,000 lawyers this November around the country. 10,000. And they're working for free. When does a lawyer work for free? That's because if this election is close, they will be there. They almost were there in 2004 in Ohio. A few thousand votes difference in this state and John Kerry and John Edwards. Hard to imagine that man was almost vice president shows you the talent pool and the talent scouting the Democrats do. John Kerry and John Edwards would have been in court in a nanosecond. You want it by just beyond what I call the margin of litigation in this state, the margin by which lawyers march into court. 
We have to win this election in the fall. If we don't win this election beyond the margin of litigation, we have to end up in court and suffer the danger that the judges are going to decide this election rather than the people, rather than you. In conclusion, voter fraud is important, and I'll tell you one reason of all the others. This is a real-life example. Do you remember the Minnesota Senate race in which the comedian was eventually seated in the United States Senate, Al Franken? Notice I say the comedian was seated. I didn't say the comedian won. I said he was seated. The, the, vote call the vote count the first election night was for Norm Coleman, the Republican incumbent. He led for two or three weeks through the first recount, then the second recount, he fell behind. And you know the job of anyone conducting a recount for the other side? You count, you count, you count until you're ahead, and then you stop counting. Well, finally, after six months of court battles, Al Franken was seated by 317 votes. Between June of 2009, when he was seated, and January 2010, when Scott Brown won that great victory in Massachusetts, the Democrats had, for a very brief window, 60 Senate votes. They could break a filibuster. Obamacare would not have passed in its present form unless that 60th vote was present, and that vote was Al Franken's. Well, we've learned...